London, England. People going about their daily business, shopping, walking, running, unsuspecting. Because little do they know that somewhere beneath their feet is a subterranean garage of dreams. This is Windrush, the top of the tree or perhaps the deepest depths in car storage. It's a bit like a virtual computer game garage brought to unbelievable life. Each of these automotive artefacts is kept in a permanent state of readiness so that the owners can whisk them away at the drop of a hat. As tantalising as it is seeing most of the cars covered up, privacy obviously being paramount for many of the clients, it is also rather fun walking along the rows of shrouded supercars playing a game of guess what lies beneath. A roof line here, a headlamp there, a hint of wheel or protruding bonnet mascot. Of course, some are rather more easily disguised than others. There is another facility like this somewhere in the Cotswolds, and the man who set it all up is Tim Earnshaw. While still at school, he rebuilt a Land Rover gearbox and then made a Morgan replica, using an MGB as a donor, not the Landy. He then spent a while working in Formula One with Ferrari, before giving up motorsports maddest circus for this. But it's fair to say that he has brought more than a little bit of a meticulous F1 ethos to the way the cars here are cared for. Tim, thank you very much for showing us around here. Um, I thought we'd go through a few of the things, because cars come in here and you don't just you know, slap a cover on them and, and <laughs> sure. leave, leave them sort of until somebody wants them again. So what do you do when a car comes in? So we've got, obviously, <coughs> Zagato here. So first thing to notice, I suppose, is I'm wearing my coat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I'm fairly hardy, but so what do you do for the temperature of this place? Sure, sure. OK, well, a good point to start. So. People like the idea of the cars being warm in a nice warm garage. Yeah, there's a certain amount of that, but let's be realistic. Cars are not warm blooded, so it's moisture what we're trying to stop. So moisture is the killer to cars. Uh, we've got two different approaches. It all depends on where we are. Uh, Cotswolds, where we are, which is our HQ, we uh, dehumidify. So we're again, we're trying to stabilize the temperature but we're actually controlling to a target of 55% relative humidity. We know that at that level, uh, it's arguably ideal for cars. They, uh, bare metal won't rust, so the brake discs stay nice and shiny, uh, but it's not too dry that we're drying out uh, the rubber and the tires or the leather, uh, that type of thing. Um, but then coming to here in London, we have chosen not to dehumidify, so we actually use thermal mass. And this is something which, Again, some people say that they have, but genuinely where we are in this sort of secret bunker, we've uh, got 10 floors approximately above us. Uh, our security wall is actually uh, double insulated um, and that maintains a very even temperature. So what we're trying to stop here is spikes in temperature. If this was not controlled in here, what we'd find temperature would drop at night you get condensation on the car, and of course on the electronics, exposed metal, it's gonna it's degrade. Again, yeah. So that thermal mass means that we don't have the rapid changes in temperature. We've got here 288 GTO and a Crow GT as well. Yeah, um, two nice cars. They come in, obviously tires, that's one thing um, we want to talk about because- Sure, you, yeah, yeah. I've always heard you always sort of, used to be the case of you, if you're going away on holiday even for a you, you Pump the tyres up on. Yeah. Do you do that here? We actually um, overinflate the tyres up to, we found 50 PSI, which some people might think is quite high, but it isn't. Makes the tyre rounder, harder, so it sits stills. The f contact area with the ground is just a little bit more rounder. Um, we actually roll the cars periodically as well, so that we're reducing that, we're uh, rolling that pressure point, even on bearings. Uh, there's a whole other topic there yeah. of. I think it's called uh, Brunel effect on bearings, right. but we won't touch on that right now. So, um, so yeah, you're right. We go up to 50. There's a nice little um, top tip here as well that by putting the tires up to 50, and only really if you're leaving the car for more than a month, anything up to that is absolutely fine. When you come to then go to road pressure, if your tire pressure's dropped down below 50 significantly, it's going to highlight to you that you've actually maybe got slow puncture. We keep walking down this way so we've obviously got all the covers the covers are presumably so they're, they're, we have about six different sizes that fit well, any different car really some people might say oh they've got their own cover 
Now, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. We choose to use our own because we actually control it very um, precisely. We have a certain way that we fold up the cover. So every time we go to put the cover on the car, uh, it goes on on the back, it rolls forward, then over the car. And we just know that we're not turning covers inside out, yeah. upside <laughs> down and all that kind of thing. There will be trace dust on the top of the cover and by folding it up like an envelope, you're encapsulating all that dust that can effectively scratch the paintwork. Now, if, like I say, typically when we get clients that bring their own covers, <laughs> they've been, not always, but typically thrown on the floor of the garage as they want to go out for that nice spring drive. Um, and yeah, they're inside out, covered in leaves. And so this way, we know we've got a, a nice control on them. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, nice and I-8 under a cover up there, but we've got older cars here, trickle chargers. Yeah, yeah. That's something that you know, most people do, even if they're storing their yeah, you know, yeah, cars yeah. at home, but you do it slightly so yeah, so we do. So what you want to avoid is, even if you're leaving a car and you use it regularly, it's not your daily driver. The trickle chargers now are so advanced that they're actually automatic. You can leave them connected. Not all of them, the one we choose CTEC, we find them to be one yeah. of the best. They will charge the battery when needed, it won't overcharge it. But before we do that, we've we actually got a, a very advanced tester that because it's impossible to see inside the battery, this will analyze how efficient the battery's working, performing, because what prior to coming to us, it could be that someone's allowed the car to, or prior to their ownership perhaps, go completely flat. And leaving a battery flat for a long time is a little bit like um, your kettle furring up inside <laughs> with hard water. It can actually fur the plates up inside, makes it less efficient. But then sometimes, uh, maybe garages, or someone's in a rush to go on that nice spring drive, yeah. could rapid charge the battery. And actually rapid charging it, it's a bit like saying to you, jump out of bed first thing <laughs> in the morning, go for a sprint. You know, yeah. it's not going to be too good for you. No. Uh, you've got to gently warm it up. And that's where the C-Tech really are great. We've done so much research on them. Absolutely. We'll keep walking down. Sure. This way, it's, it's so fun trying to guess what's <laughs> underneath what comes. You kind of recognise things. Like, oh, that's kind of. Oh, and yeah, definitely, yeah. Definitely one of those. I mean, it? there's a massive spectrum of cars here. I mean, yeah. it's, this is glorious. It's a beautiful spec on this car as well, it, isn't it? It's really, it really is lovely. awesome. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> presumably, with all the new cars that sort of then come out, you you have to very much keep up to date as to sort of how different yeah. things are being serviced. Yeah. We've got hybrid cars. Yeah. And um, things like that. There's a, They've all got their own little quirks and we, so we're always listening, we're also mm. learning. So there will always be little things like, so the Bugattis actually come with their own charger, like so a lot of the plugins do. And those chargers are all different. Their mode, their status, their operation yeah. and- Bear on down there as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, walk up, because I can see a E type, which I think is an eagle. E -type, uh, yeah, actually. that is an eagle, um, yeah. And coming back to how you look after these, um, I know antifreeze is something else you, you mentioned that you, yeah, yeah. you look into. Yeah, first thing we do is um, check all the fluids. And one of those is not just check the, f uh, the level of the coolant, it's we choose to use a refractometer. So we take up a pet, we put a little drop on, <laughs> and we have a look and it tells us kind of, first of all, what the concentration of that. It is a so summer coolant, it helps keep the cool, cool car cooler in the summer. Uh, which going by last summer is quite important. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. And also uh, it's got anti-corrosion inhibitors in there. So, you know, last thing you want is for your beautiful Eagle to be pristine on the outside, but the inside of the engine, <laughs> you know, slowly degrading. So I keep walking out this way. I remember you said, oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, yeah, some good sights that go past. But, cool things, um, but we've kind of come up what we call as the Windrush service. So it's everything's included you don't get to choose whether it's bronze silver gold platinum <laughs> it is everything how we would want our car looked after yeah. they get and as part of that occasionally some clients new clients will say oh my car doesn't need a charger or don't bother with the fluid checks i know it's been <coughs> rebuilt by xyz and we say look uh, fantastic but do you know what we're going to check the fluid levels anyway just for peace of mind but this particular client uh, had his e-type rebuilt and he said, look, guys, I don't actually want you to start the car up. And we said, mm, OK, you sure about that? Yeah, yeah. He said, actually, my engine builder suggested take the plugs out every quarter, 
uh, put a little bit of um, teaspoon of engine oil down each uh, cylinder and then put it in gear and rock it. Just keep the cylinders all coated, you know, rotate and what have you. And we thought, well, okay, that's a good idea. So we do that and we report back to him every time we do that. And then it got to, I think we've been doing it for two years, coming up three years now. And he phoned up, he's in the States, he was coming over, just come and have coffee, come and see us, see the car. So I said, uh, just one thing, we are noticing that fuel is going off a lot quicker. There's a lot of, there's, was 5%, it's now 10%, I think, uh, ethanol and fuel, yeah. which ethanol is hydroscopic. Okay. So it absorbs mo uh, moisture, but it also evaporates. So you're basically left with water and petrol in the fuel lines and throughout the fuel system, which can lead to corrosion. It also, uh, the fuel go, it's basically the term fuel going off. So I then said to him, look, you know, I think your fuel might be going off and maybe we should suggest um, we have it drained and, and replenished, just a preventative type mm -hmm. approach. And he said, no, no, no need to do that. And I said, are you sure? He said, yes, yes. Yeah. And I said, oh, can I ask why? He said, oh, uh, before putting it away, I had the system drained and I had uh, pure racing fuel <laughs> <laughs> and run through. So it was like 100, 100 octane and no organics yeah. in it at all. <laughs> and, I was, and he had one on me. It was the and it was such a good idea. Yeah. I then did some research. I think it's called VP Fuels. I did some research. and. I'm tempted to buy some <laughs> for my own car. It's the next thing. <laughs> but, but yeah, and, but it is incredibly expensive. Yeah. Um, so, mm, but what, so what we do as an interim measure is actually, for the classics that we know that are coming in long term, we get some stuff from the States called Stable, it's a fuel stabiliser, yeah. and we uh, dispense a little bit in, run it through, and it does actually help a little. It yeah. helps a bit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Keep yeah. walking up this way. I think that would certainly be in a dream garage of mine, the four, <laughs> 458 Speciale. Yeah, Lovely spot yeah, as well, uh, isn't it? Yeah. No stripes, it's just... Oh, I mean, just, yeah. certainly a modern classic, isn't it? I yeah, mean, what absolutely. a car. Yeah. Um, I suppose we should point out wonderful cars here, and it, there's a temptation to think that it's storage can sort of mean a bit like a sort of the, the back end of a museum where stuff's just never seen or it's not used, but the whole point of what you're doing with all this is mm. that these cars then do get taken out and yeah. used. They're more likely to use it because they're not going to think, oh, I'm going to have to spend half a day getting that, so I won't bother to take it exactly. out. I'll just leave it where yeah. it is. Yeah, I mean, let, let's be honest. Yeah. Yeah, having a car is a hassle. You know, you take it for an MOT, hit service. It's all downtime, especially mm. if your time is finite, your time poor. Mm. So, yes, it's a little bit of a luxury service, but actually we're giving people the time to really enjoy the car more. Mm. So, you know, quite often the car will be with us for nine months, let's say, and then it will be going on an alpine tour. <laughs> you know, we're, we, and we slightly feel the pressure thinking, cripes, I hope the car's reliable, but <laughs> we know it will be reliable because we're doing everything utmost. And we've had the call where someone's um, been, for example, you know, been down on their 21st <laughs> running anniversary, down in uh, Reem uh, with their Ferrari 575, and it's developed a fault. I'm, I'm very unlike Ferrari. Yeah. <laughs> and we've had the phone call, um, I remember it clearly, um, you know, three o'clock on a Friday afternoon. Hi, Tim, mm. uh, with my Ferrari, it's developed a fault. I know this is a long shot, but is there any chance you could transport our, my other car, which was a 993 turbo? A reliable Porsche? Oh, right, yeah, yes, yeah, there we are. Yeah, not, we're, not with the living up to stereotypes <laughs> or anything here. Yeah, I know, just that. Right. This is true, it's true. <laughs> Um, we couldn't make it up. <laughs> Maybe you could. Um, <laughs> so we then transport. So and then, and it was just such a nice, warm feeling, honestly, yeah. that we managed to get the car out of storage, and it was all on the button already. But check it over within 45 minutes of the phone call. Cars loaded up on our transporter, heading down to the Channel Tunnel. By 11 that night, it's at the chateau. The yeah. guys at. <laughs> I mean. I still love the cars, but the bit I never saw myself enjoying the people element as much. Yeah. And now the people we meet, the stories of what they do and what we do for them and how people say how they couldn't have so many cars in London if it wasn't for us. It and that brings the cars alive as well, if you know the people behind them. It and does, sort of yeah, it really special, does. And I think so. then you kind of take comfort that it's not just a beautiful car sitting static being preserved, it's actually someone's pride and joy, it's someone's baby. We are, yeah. we're babysitting. <laughs> so kind of like the baby monitor. <laughs> Absolutely. 
Tim, it's fantastic to see you down here. Thank you very much. You're welcome. There. Thanks a lot. <laughs> And so we leave this amazing bat cave of hibernating Ferraris, Bugattis and Porsches and head back up into a confusing world where humidity can run rampant and people walk about unaware of the makeup of their antifreeze. <laughs>